Good morning. Good morning. Pretty excited to be with you again. I had a great time in January, and I'm glad to be with you again this morning. You're a sweet church. <laughs> really nice. And the beautiful thing is I'm getting to know your, your pastor and Sally and great people. Oh, my gosh. And um, I like your pastor even more because when I'm in that little office over there, I'm looking at all the plaques, you know, and the um, graduate things. And I discovered something. His first name is not Jeff. It's Robert Jeffrey Munnis. Now, you may think, well, that's not a big deal. I got to tell you, great pastors, um, great come and are known by their middle names. I'm T. Joel Fairley, son of W. Lowell Fairley. And, I, and so I thought, he's okay by me. I love that. And I mentioned my father um, because today happens to be his uh, 96th birthday. I lost him, we lost him about 10 years ago. And uh, February 19th is always important to me. And so in one sense today, you're gonna get a little bit of who I am um, because who I am, I am myself with all the warts and carbuncles that come with it. I am myself with my victories and my mistakes through 67 years of life. Um, I was a younger man when I came to you um, in January. Now stands before you an older man, because in between that time I had a birthday. But in those years, I cannot deny the fact that my father, W. Lowell Fairley, an American Baptist pastor all his life, had so much influence upon me. And I would have to say, as I agree, as um, I discovered from some of my seminary profs who listened to a radio show that he did in Pasadena on Sunday nights for two years from eight to 10 called Let's Talk on KRLA, a rock and roll exclusive station. And he shared that there are two pastors who are on this show and people would simply call in with any questions regarding faith or anything. And he shared it with a UCC pastor by the name of David Held. And they would um, exchange different phone calls. People would call in, he'd take one and then take the other. But my seminary prof, when I was in Eastern Baptist Seminary, Doug Brown, uh, when I first began, he came up to me and he said to me, he said, you're, you're Lowell Fairley's son, aren't you? I couldn't deny it. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, I want to tell you something. I was a student at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. And he said, I learned more from your father on Sunday night from 8 to 10 for two years regarding the shape of my faith and my theology. And he was very important to me, and I wanted you to know that. And then he was very hard on me when it came to my grades. <laughs> this sermon and the title of this sermon is one of my fathers. And so in one sense, I, I preach it to honor him and honor the words that he had shared for so many years in his sermons to bring life to people, to bring transformation to their lives through the gospel and through who he was. So Lord, I don't want this to be about Lowell Fairley. I don't even want this to be about me. I want it to be about you what you want to say to people, what you want to say to us, how you want to light our hearts on fire 
for a new sense and understanding of who we are in you and who you have called us to be to the world. So, Lord, whatever you need to do to get us out of the way so you can speak, we ask that you would do that. In your name we do pray. Amen. So, Kaya, what translation did you read? Uh, NRV. NRV. New Rib. Yeah. That seems to be the, the scripture of the day. I am reading from... The, um, yeah. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent bow power belongs to God and not to us. Right off the word treasure. Treasure. Paul says we have this treasure in us. The Greek word for treasure is theasoron where we get the word thesaurus. It connotes great value and that the definition of the word describes as a treasure that comes from the marrow, as treasure that comes from the marrow. Speaking of something that comes from the very center of who we, of our physical body, as you know, bone marrow is responsible for producing 220 billion blood cells a day. Blood is the source of our life. So now, Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, this treasure in us. This treasure that is at the very marrow of who we are, the treasure that Paul is referring to is the life of Christ in us. He has penetrated the deepest part or desires to penetrate the deepest part of who we are at the very core of our being. It's very interesting that we've heard all our life when we were growing up, especially if we were involved in Sunday school, and if you're a Baptist like I am, you can't get away from Sunday school. And I'm going to go on record and say that Sunday school was not my favorite thing. I didn't like Sunday school. I liked snacks. I liked refreshments. But we had to get through Sunday school to get to the refreshments and have the, um, so we could drink the lifeblood of the Baptist church. And the lifeblood of the Baptist church was that red deep punch. It was served at every, every reception. Every time there was any kind of after church gathering, we drank that red punch. I couldn't wait to get there and to get a flavorless cookie for, for my snack. So now you know how I felt about Sunday school at that time. But from the very beginning, at Sunday school, we are taught and we are even invited and asked to, and we ask people, have you invited Jesus into your heart? Have you asked Jesus into your heart. That was a part of our language. That's part of what we did. Part of who we were. And yes, I did. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> that concept, that concept is amazing. The reason why I say this is we look at it to the place where the real you know, we're inviting Jesus into our heart as if, as if he is, it's something we have to do. But if we look at it another way, it is the desire that Jesus wants to be with us. 
He wants to be in our lives. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He wants to be in our life. We are often put it in and in, 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 in hear it in such a way that we need to have Jesus in our life. You need to have Jesus in your life. You need this. And we find liberty and freedom when we discover Jesus wants to be with us. He wants to be with us. Why? Because we have value to him. We have value to him. You're important to me. In John chapter 14, he says, In my father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. God wants us with him. God wants us with him. God wants all of us with him. That's the great invitation. I want you to be with me. And so many times we like to, um, to determine who God wants with him. And we question, oh, God, God doesn't want that one. Let me clear that up right now. If you are one sitting or listening and wondering why God would want to have anything to do with me or you and I'm not worthy, you are. You are. God wants you so much so that at the very center of who we are as people, and as human beings, his desire is to sweat. That's where he wants to set up his dwelling place here on earth, is at the very center of who we are. This treasure, this priceless thing, which is the life of Christ, wants to live within us. The NIV says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And he goes on to say in verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Why? Because of the treasure. Because of the treasure. There this world will, will eat at our value, will chip away and even expend energy to chip away at our own innate value in God. Christ in us, it is our desire, God's desire for us to realize every day our value to him, not just when we get things right, not when we do the right things, but even in the midst of our despair, even in the midst of our failures, God wants us to understand you are important to me. You have value to me. You haven't lost your value. You're important to me. And then he says, where's this treasure? This treasure is in earthen vessels. As some translations say, jars of clay. Earthen vessels are that things, those jars of clay. You could see them everywhere. They were the utilitarian vessels where values, valuable things were put in it, life-giving things like water carried in these food they were in every household in the time of christ everybody knew what jars of clay were you almost forgot about them they were so commonplace if you go to the holy land they're all over the place and we we're told by a guide 
that if it's on the top of the ground, we can take them, but we can't dig in because then that would be archaeology and you don't have a license to be an archaeologist. I did. Dug in the ground. But these are very simple things. The well-to-do, the rich, they kept their vessels. They kept their materials in, in, in vessels like ivory and glass and marble, brass and costly wood. People like you and me, we had jars of clay. That's where the valuables went into the jars of clay. What is the equivalent, that common thing that we carry things in? Well, it used to be, and I'm sorry that it has evolved into this, it used to be brown paper bags, or as Chuck Yeager in his book refers to them as paper pokes when he grew up in West Virginia. Brown paper bags, just utilitarian, just something. The fancy kids at my school that I went to um, had lunch boxes. I didn't have a lunch box. I had a brown paper bag. I carried my lunch. This was the common thing. This is what we all used. This commons, it was our jar of clay. And I'm sorry that the brown paper bags have evolved into things that now are perhaps choking our planet, plastic bags. Brown paper bag was of the earth, just as earthen vessels. So we, have, we, we could say this, you have this gift in a brown paper bag, common stuff. When I was, uh, when my father was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Scottsdale in Arizona, I was in high school at the time. And there was a gentleman that he befriended from Chicago, and uh, his name was Charlie Fritz. And Charlie Fritz was a, was a snowbird. Now, I don't know if you know about snowbirds up here or even have them. But snowbirds are people who, living, who live in the north and live in snow country and then come invade the south during the winter time. And Scottsdale, Arizona was a favorite landing place of snowbirds. Well, Charlie, Charlie Fritz was a snowbird. And he and Joyce would come down and, and uh, live for three months and, and attend the church. But Charlie would sit in the back and he'd attend the church like this, listening just because his wife wanted to go to church, and so he would come and accompany her. Well, my father had the privilege of um, just through relationships and through being with him. Charlie gave his life to the Lord and was baptized. Shortly after that, he made a secret visit to our house. Wasn't not so secret because I caught him. One afternoon, there was a the doorbell rang, I was downstairs, I opened the door in time to see Charlie stealing away down the front path. And I said, hi, Charlie. He said, oh, hi. He said, and then he pointed to something that was at the door, that he left at the door, he pointed to that, and he said, this is for your folks, and then was gone, just like that. I went, okay. So I looked down, and there was a brown paper bag from the grocery store, bashes to be exact. So I picked up the bashes grocery bag and put it in the kitchen. I didn't look inside. It wasn't for me. This is for your folks. So I put it in the kitchen. Then I went about my business. A little while later, I hear my mom's voice my father's voice. What's this? I said, oh, Charlie left it on the door step. What is it? I don't know. 
So they looked in. This brown paper bag was filled with several packages wrapped up in that very familiar white butcher paper. Again, something very common. When they began to unwrap the white butcher paper from the brown paper bag, what they discovered in it was amazing, wonderful cuts of beef. Steaks we had, I, I grew, if steak night was chuck steak. That's what it was for us. This is, this is, these were cuts of meat I could not pronounce. Chateaubriand. Filet mignon. Porterhouse. These beautiful cuts of beef that we could never afford on our own. And Charlie brought this priceless treasure to us and presented it to us in a brown paper bag. And when we think about it, and we think about the life of Christ, and we think of who he is, God chose to reveal himself to the world through the common stuff, through the flesh, of the earth. In reality, you might say that on Bethlehem, Jesus came to us wrapped in a brown paper bag to present who he is. And guess what? Really? Honestly? When you think about it, when you get rid of all the trappings of the things that the world says is important for us to have and have to be about, we're just brown paper bags. We just present ourselves to the world as we are. Warts and carbuncles. Faults. Just as we are. But there's something about us. The world wants and needs and desires. Scripture says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we had beheld him in his glory. Glory as of the only begotten son of the father. Full of grace and truth. When the world looks at the church. They may see fancy steeples. They may see the trappings. They may see a a theology or a doctrine that may be off-putting to them. In reality, the church is filled with brown paper bags. And because of the Lord and what he wants to do in us and through us and for us, I don't know what your brown paper bag is filled with, I don't know. I don't know what treasure is there. I don't know what your treasure is. But it's there. You have it. And it's precious. And it's life-giving. It's life-giving. For we have this treasure. in an earthen vessel, in a brown paper bag, to show that the transcendent power belongs to God, to show that the beauty of what is in there belongs to God. Jesus said it this way, let your light so shine before all people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Shall we pray? Lord, I ask you and I thank you. I ask that, Lord, you would help us even now. Let your spirit come upon us that we may see 
our value that you have brought to us, to the very marrow of who we are. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And in your name we do pray. Amen.